Hello to my friends joining us via recording. It is April 22nd and we are going to talk today about the way that vision works a little bit more in depth. We're going to talk about vision disorders and we're hopefully going to get it all the way through hearing. So a couple of memes for us today to, to start off our day right. Um, first one we've agreed, there are several of us here today that this is us. In the middle of the night, this is totally me. I have no idea what time it is when I wake up, unless I'm like this close to my alarm clock. So I can't see anything in the middle of the night. But my vision's fine. Actually, I wouldn't say that. I, there's no way. I know my vision's not fine. Um, I'm I'm very nearsighted. Probably uh, a lot of us that, that wear glasses are nearsighted, including apparently our little friend Norval here. So he was he's wishing that he had, had worn his contacts today, so he didn't end up cuddling with a cat. So little bit of humor about our, our vision disorders. That is a big part of, of our class today. So let's go to where we left off in office hours yesterday. Yeah, you love it, Mary Lou. I love it too. I, I was saying at the very beginning of, of when I opened up the room, I think I spend entirely too much time like browsing for memes, but hey, you do what it takes, right? I, I find some good ones for us. All right, here's where we, where we left off. Uh, when we ended our class time before. Uh, at the end of class, if you want to talk about stuff related to lab, we can we can talk about stuff related to lab at the end of, of class. Today's primarily lecture day. Um, here's where we left off last time. Um, when we are talking about our the process of vision, let's remind ourselves there is a place in the eyeball that light waves always have to be focused for us to be able to see them. Um, what are, what's the place in the eyeball that I have to focus my light waves to be able to perceive them? Does anyone remember? Where do they have to go? Yes, yeah, a couple of us are, are chiming in here. Uh, for you to be able to see light waves, so for light waves to be perceived, and when I use that perceived word, that basically means detected, um, for you to be able to process that they're there, we have to focus them, they must be focused on the retina. Because the vision disorders that, that we're learning about related to, to the process of seeing, they're all a problem with this. At the end of the day, it all comes down to something went wrong with trying to get uh, those light waves focused on the retina. So when I look at things, there's things that I can look at up close like your computer screen that's close to you right now, when things that you're looking at are really close to you, notice how they come into the eyeball kind of at an angle. So I see them kind of angling up and angling down. All these light waves come into the eyeball. I have to focus them back here on the retina. They've got to get there. So some of the light waves that come in, come in at an angle. Here on the outside I can see. Some of them come in at less of an angle. See how it says here that it's kind of nearly parallel? Or it comes in basically straight on. But I still have to get it to travel to the same place in the eyeball. It's still going to end up at the retina. For me to get it there then, I'm going to have to change the direction it's traveling. Whether it comes from an angle, like I see here, whether it comes from straight. I've got to make sure it always ends up in the same place. It's always got to get to the retina. There are two main structures that I have in the eyeball that I use to bend my light waves to make sure that they get to the retina. Can you guys help me out in the chat? What structures do I use to bend the light waves to get them to the retina? How do I bend them there? Okay, so the first one I can see really well in my image, well actually it's the second one technically, uh, is the lens. The lens is inside the eyeball. The lens helps to bend my light waves when they're inside the eyeballs, or inside the eyeball, excuse me, to get back to the retina part of the eyeball. Before they even get into the eyeball, the first part of the eyeball that they encounter is the other structure you guys mentioned for me. Yeah, the other, the other place that bends the light waves is the cornea. <clears throat> so the cornea is the front of the eyeball. Really, when we think about the job of the cornea, its main job is to bend those light waves. So it does a lot of bending for me, a lot of focusing for me. Whether my light waves come in at an, a steep angle, like I see here, 
or whether they come in from flat or from straight. The cornea is always going to bend them to help them get to my lens. <clears throat> my lens can also bend them as well because the lens it's, is kind of a second check for me to make sure they're going to hit the retina here in the back part of the eye. When I'm looking at things, so you have these two pictures, right? One of these pictures shows close vision, meaning, again, that's something you're looking at that's close to you, like your computer screen, versus something that's farther away, distant vision. Distant vision, meaning we're, we're in the distance. Um, both times, I have to make sure we hit the retina, right? That's what we said. We must be focused on the retina. I can't change the shape of my cornea without having like laser eye surgery. My cornea is, is stuck. We're not going to change the shape of my cornea. But what I can change the shape of is the lens in the middle, the lens inside the eyeball. When my lights come in from close compared to when they come in from a distance, I do different things with my lens to help it bend the light waves the way it needs to. And somebody mentioned in the chat for me the things called the ciliary muscles. If you were trying to describe what the ciliary muscles do, what would be an easy way to describe what ciliary muscles do? What's their job, ciliary muscles? Yeah, they stretch and relax. They, when they stretch and relax, they pull on the lens that's going to enable the lens to change shape. Uh, remember I mentioned to you guys yesterday that the lens is, is flexible, so it's not always the same shape. And we can definitely see that in our picture here. So here's my, my lens. They, they say over here that it's bulging. Remember, I have a three-year-old at home, so I like to call this one the little short and stout version, like the little teapot. So we got the little teapot going on over here, short and stout lens. That's squeezed in, in well, I guess squeeze this way. We'll do this way. It's squeezed from top to bottom, meaning it's really wide in the middle. That's what I have to do to my lens to help it bend and send those light waves all the way back to the retina. When I need to see something that's far away, those muscles actually stretch out the lens. lens. Now it's what I like to say is long and lean. Now it's really tall, so the middle part's not nearly as wide. All of this has to do with the fact that the way that those light waves entered the eyeball was different. But I got to bend them and get them back to the same place. Now, I probably won't go so technical on you guys on the exam um, to ask you about whether the muscles are relaxed or contracted because it actually feels a little bit backwards when we're talking about whether they're relaxed or contracted. But let me try to explain it to you just in case you noticed that and it, it weirded you out a little bit. When I'm looking at the process of vision, this one right here, we're starting with, with our shortened stout lens here. So we're starting with, you're looking at something up close, it's gotta get all the way here to the back. What makes my lens actually get short and stout, squeezed in the middle, is when the muscles, these ciliary muscles actually contract. Now, these muscles are running in a circle around your eyeball. So when these circle muscles contract, they go from being wide to being squeezed to the middle. When they squeeze to the middle, then the little fibers that they use, the proteins that they attach to the lens with, they get a little bit looser and it gives us a little more slack. That lens squeezes, squeezes down and bulges in the middle. So technically, when I'm making my, my lens get really short and stout, my muscles, the ciliary muscles, are actually contracted around it. They're squeezing toward the middle, and that lens gets big in the middle. When my muscles relax, they're no longer squeezing toward the middle. They're actually relaxing toward the outside of the eyeball, and that ends up pulling that lens flatter. So just as a heads up for you, again, I'm not going to include that on the homework or on, on the exam, whether the muscles are relaxed or contracted. Uh, but when those muscles relax, they spread out farther, which pulls that lens out farther. When they are contracting, that ends up actually squeezing the lens down. So just a heads up for us. But big idea, biggest thing we must know with these pictures here is what we underlined up here. We've got to get our light to focus on the retina. It doesn't matter if we're looking at something that's close or something that's far away. It's always got to end up on the retina. 
I, I highlight that idea and that's an important idea for us because when we start talking about vision disorders, remember every single vision disorder is going to be a problem with not getting our light waves to the retina, not getting them focused in the right place on the retina. Now, what I'll mention for you is when we talk about our light waves coming into the eyeball, so see all of, all of these waves coming in. All of these waves are supposed to end up at one singular point. Your ability to see them or focus on them requires all of them to end up together in the same place. So when we start looking at vision disorders like this one, for example, over here, where light waves come in at a bunch of different nearby places on the retina, but I don't have this single point on the retina where they all meet, I'm not going to see clearly unless we have this point where things are meeting. So we've got to focus them on the retina, as in they've all got to end up together at the same place. If they're not together at the same place, you can't see them clearly. All right, so let's start with myopia. I'm going to rely on my friends here that, that a lot of us said we at least started this, this lecture notes packet. When I talk about myopia, what's the easy person name? for what myopia is. What do normal people call myopia? Yeah, it's a big long word, right? So, so myopia is, is nearsightedness, nearsightedness. If I am nearsighted, can I see things that are far away or things that are close? If I'm nearsighted, what kind of things can I see? I promise it's not a trick question. If I'm nearsighted, yeah, a couple of us are, are chiming in. If I'm nearsighted, I see things that are near. So things that are close are clear. We'll say that. Things that are close to me are clear. So um, Dr. Aulis has myopia. Let's just toss that one out there. So I have myopia. Um, I, am, I am very nearsighted. As in, like, if I don't have my glasses or contacts on, I'm, like, this farsighted. So in case you're wondering, it's, it's right about here. So um, nearsightedness means that when things are close, or in my case, very, very close, I can see them. Things that are far away, not so much. They're blurry. I, I can't focus on them. So when I talk about, here's then, we'll use our process of elimination. When I talk about hyperopia, with hyperopia, what's the easy word for, for what that is? Yeah, hyperopia, think of it kind of as, as the opposite of my myopia. So farsightedness, that's hyperopia. That means that things that are far away are clear. So that means something that's close to me, I can't see it. But when I'm looking across the room, what I can see those things clearly. That's hyperopia. So myopia and hyperopia, they both have the same basic problem. The same basic problem is that see this little point where I'm focusing my light waves right here and this little point where I'm focusing my light waves. In both of these conditions, the place I focus the light waves is not on the retina. And that's going to be the way it is with every single vision disorder. Where I focus stuff is not on the retina. The reason it's not on the retina is, is two different things, though. Myopia and hyperopia, the reason I focus in the wrong place is, is, is opposite re reasons, if you will. And it is shown here on your picture. It shows us what's wrong. Here's what's wrong in myopia. The eyeball is too long. The eyeball is too long. In hyperopia, the eyeball is too short. See, remember back from our previous picture where we talked about we can change the shape of the lens to bend light to where the retina should be. Except in a patient with myopia, we bend the light rays. We're trying to put them on the retina. Here's the place where the retina should be, where it is in a normal eye. Except when I bend it and focus them there, the retina is not there. The retina's back here. It's been stretched out. The eyeball is too long. 
So uh, the retina goes with the eyeball there toward the very back of the eyeball. The retina's back here waiting for the light waves to come, except all the lights are focusing right here. Hey, does anyone happen to remember from our, our review yesterday, there's a fluid that fills this area here in the back? Does anyone remember which one? This was the, the jello one right here in the back part of the eye. Does anyone happen to remember what we called this fluid back here in the eyeball? I can't remember if we actually, did we talk about it? Maybe we didn't. I'll give us a hint. Yeah, so so a couple of us are, are chiming in. Absolutely. So the, the fluids are called humors. Um, how funny, right? The humor of the eyeball. Um, we have two kinds of humor. So vitreous humor is, oops, vitreous humor is what I find in the back part of the eyeball. This has a whole bunch of proteins in it. Um, this is the big vitreous humor back here. Its job is to keep the eyeball circular in the back part of the eye. Here in the front part of the eye, as a reminder for us, is where I have the really watery fluid. The really watery fluid up there is the stuff we call aqueous, aqueous humor. So there's, there's two kinds of fluid in the eyeball, the aqueous humor, the watery stuff in the front, the vitreous humor, the protein stuff here in the back. Hey, not a trick question. The vitreous humor, this does or does not have rods and cones in it. Does the vitreous humor have, have the cells that do vision, rods and cones inside of it? Yeah, I've got at least one person who's, who's chiming in. I promise it's not a trick question. There's no rods and cones in vitreous humor. Yeah, this is just fluid. It's fluid back here that has some proteins. Um, there's no cells that perceive light that live in the fluid. The only place that the cells that perceive light live is in the retina along the back part of the eye, which is why I have to focus light waves there. I don't have rods and cones anywhere else except inside the retina. So when a person has myopia, we focus the light waves in the middle the vitreous humor in the middle of the jello liquid stuff that's here in the back part of the eye. If I focus them right here, if this is where I could see them clearly, there's nobody there to see them clearly. So I can't perceive light waves that focus right here. Let's bounce over to hyperopia, the opposite. So hyperopia, remember we can see things that are far away. We can't see things that are up close. So what happens is those light waves come into the eyeball my lens bends them and tries to put them where the retina should be. Here's where they all focus, where I, I should be able to see them. Except when I'm trying to focus them all back here, there's no eyeball here. This back part, back behind the eye, there'd be a whole bunch of adipose tissue back here. Let's try my question again. Does adipose tissue have rods and cones? Are there rods and cones in adipose tissue? Yeah, there we go. We're feeling a little more brave. We know more about adipose tissue, right? There's no rods and cones in adipose tissue. So I focused all the light waves back here on the adipose, except there's nobody there to see it. My retina is up here. Notice that those light waves are all hitting the retina in slightly different locations. If I don't make them all hit the retina in the same place, I can't focus on what I'm seeing. It's going to be really blurry for me. So the, where the light waves hit the retina, they're not focused. They're not landing on the right place. They're trying to focus here back in that adipose tissue behind the eyeball. So I can't see them clearly. So big picture, because remember, you guys study pro tip, right, in your, your lab packet. You know that I love to compare and contrast things. These things are opposites. So one of them I can see up close. One of them I can see far away. But the thing that makes them similar to each other is in both of these conditions, I'm not focusing light on the retina. I'm not getting light where it needs to go. Now, I'm not getting light where it needs to go because of another similarity between them. In both of these conditions, I've got a problem with the shape of my eyeball. We said, we'll go back here to the one we were just talking about. We said in hyperopia, in farsightedness, I try to focus those light waves 
and I end up focusing them back in the adipose tissue, back where the eyeball should be, where the retina should be. Except in these patients, the retina is not all the way back here. The retina is actually up closer to the front of the eyeball. So in hyperopia, my eyeball is the wrong shape because it's squeezed together. It's closer together in the middle. In myopia, we actually have the opposite problem. My retina is back farther than it should be, so the eyeball has been stretched out toward the back a little bit more. So if you remember from the guided lesson, I told you guys what my childhood optometrist said. He told me that my eyeballs are shaped like a football instead of like a soccer ball, not the normal shape. So if your, your eyeballs are longer than they should be, we try to focus the, the light in front of where the retina is. If your, your eyeballs are shorter than they should be, we're trying to focus the light behind where the retina would be because your lens doesn't have a brain of its own. It just focuses where normally it would expect to find the retina. If it's not there, sorry, you just can't see. So problem here uh, is the shape of the eyeball, whether it's too long or too short, we end up having a problem with what we said was the big picture with vision, that we absolutely must focus light on the retina. Somebody asked the question about astigmatism. Astigmatism is actually different. So we will talk about astigmatism. Um, it, it's, it's, you can have both, you would have one of these conditions as well as astigmatism, um, but it's actually caused by a different problem. So we will talk about astigmatism here in, in, in just a minute. Yeah, so it, it's a different problem. It, it, it gives us the same problem where light doesn't focus correctly, though, um, but it, it's because of a, a slightly different thing. What I'll mention for you guys is when you have nearsightedness versus farsightedness, you use a different kind of, of lenses or different kind of glasses to correct that. Um, so if you've ever tried to trade glasses with someone, um, just to be silly, obviously I'm the only one that's probably ever done this. Um, someone who has nearsightedness, their lenses are what we call concave, uh, meaning that their shape here in the back is they kind of cave in here in the back. The goal of a concave lens is to help those light waves go back farther in the eyeball. Because remember, when you are nearsighted, your retina is farther in the eyeball than the lens expects. If I send those light waves into the eyeball at a slightly wider angle, that'll help the eyeball stretch them and get back to where they go. In someone who is very far-sighted, we don't need those light waves to travel farther in the eyeball. We actually need them to come up closer. So we would use a completely different shape of lens called a convex lens, where you can see it kind of bulging on the two sides. By bending the light waves or focusing them a little bit closer, they don't go as far in the eyeball, allowing us to actually hit the retina. I said this earlier, I said it yesterday when we were talking about the colors of light. This is not a physics class, so I'm not going to ask you on, on the exam or on the homework, do we use convex lenses or concave lenses? But what I could ask you is if we'd use the same shape of lens for someone who's farsighted and someone who's nearsighted. If I asked you that question, do I use the same shape of lenses for farsightedness and nearsightedness, what would we say? Yeah, exactly. We'd say no, <laughs> because if I use the same shape, they would bend the light the same way, and bending the light the same way is not going to help me. One of them needs that light go farther. One of them needs to make that light stay closer. So I use different shapes of lenses. Again, I'm not going to ask you to, to identify whether it's convex or concave. Uh, but we are going to use different shapes to, to bend the light waves. All right, before I move on, give me any questions we have right now about nearsightedness or farsightedness, or give me a thumbs up. Let me, let me see how we're feeling about these two disorders. We got a little thumbs up, got a little dance party going on. So we'll call it good on myopia and hyperopia. Um, here's one thing I'll mention for you as we get ready to move on. These two conditions, myopia and hyperopia, 
Uh, these are things that people are born with or that will typically develop. Um, yeah, I like it with the glasses. Yeah, that's that's fitting with what we're talking about, right? So uh, myopia and hyperopia. You are born with these or they typically develop in childhood, um, early adolescence. Exactly. Like Eileen said. So these vision disorders are things are the reasons why things get real awkward in middle school, right? Where we have to start wearing glasses or let's be real. By the time I hit middle school, my vision was so bad. It's like, shoot, I need contacts. Like I need them now. So, um, we, this, this is why we, we see glasses in young people. Um, or contacts in, in young people. Uh, there was a question, let me see here. Uh, so the question is, the retina's role in vision is to get the light to focus right. Um, not quite. Let me put that question to the class here. What parts of the eyeball are most important in getting the light to focus? What parts of the eyeball would we say help us to focus the light best? Yeah, so there's two. The, the two parts that bend the light are, are the parts that focus it. So that's going to be the cornea. That's going to be the lens. Um, when we talk about the job of the retina, what would you guys say the job of the retina is in vision? What does the retina do? We focus the light on it. Now the retina, exactly. Yeah, the retina is, is where the light ends up for me to be able to perceive it or to detect it. Um, this is where we, we take the light waves from your environment and actually start sending them to the nervous system. So the retina is part of the nervous system. These other parts, like the cornea and the lens, they're not part of the nervous system. They're just part of the eye. They bend the light to get it to the right place so that the retina can perceive it or so that the retina can detect it. Okay. Let's talk about our next vision disorder. Our next vision disorder, it's not as, as nicely labeled, it's kind of on my picture here, is called presbyopia. Presbyopia. Let's see if we remember from our notes. In presbyopia, can you see things that are close to you or things that are far away? If you have presbyopia, where can you see things? Yeah, so a couple of us are chiming in. In presbyopia, we can see things, so can see things that are far away. Okay, let me stretch your mind a little bit then, make you do a little bit of typing. What was the name of the vision disorder that we just talked about that we could also see things that were far away? What's the other one? that we can see far away things. What's its technical name? Not not just farsightedness. What's the technical name for that? Exactly. Yes. So here's a reminder for us that hyperopia was another one that we can see things far away. There's another one. Presbyopia is different from hyperopia, but remember you know that Dr. Aulis loves compare and contrast. So when we're doing compare and contrast and I ask you, how are these conditions the same? Well, in presbyopia and hyperopia, for both of them, I can see things that are far away. I cannot see things that are up close. Presbyopia does not affect the same um, population, the same kinds of people, as hyperopia does. Does anyone remember when, when the notes said we start to develop presbyopia? Yeah, so presbyopia, so it typically develops uh, around ages 35 to 50. Pretty much all of us in our lifetime will develop presbyopia. Um, so the way that I like to think of presbyopia I like to call it age-related farsightedness. You want to put it in, in easy words, farsightedness. Age-related farsightedness. Uh, yes, it, it can develop even later than that, absolutely. Um, but this is the typical age when most people start to see it, sometime in, in ages 35 to 50. 
is when it, about when it pops up. But but by the end of our lives, honestly, pretty much all of us are going to have press myopia. Like it's just our fate in life, our lot in life. Um, yeah, so I, I, I probably am not going to be as, as specific as like, oh, is this something that's in people ages 35 to 50 or in seniors? Um, I, I would just would say that this is a disorder that doesn't develop in adolescence. Put it that way. Um, this is not something that I see developing in a high schooler. They might have trouble seeing things up close, but if they have trouble seeing things up close, it's because they have hyperopia. It's not because they have presbyopia. Presbyopia is caused by different problems. When I look at my picture here, uh, my picture shows me that what those problems are that we have. So let's start with identifying and circling right here, the thing that's the same between presbyopia and hyperopia. This is the same in presbyopia and hyperopia. My problem is, is still that I can't focus my, my light waves on the retina. I actually focus them behind the retina. I'm sending it back in that adipose tissue back here that you guys told me doesn't have rods and cones. That's, that's correct. Um, so there are, there's two things that lead to presbyopia. And Pilar mentioned the first one for us. The first one is a problem with my lens. So in, in easy words, like Pilar mentioned, my lens gets harder. Remember when we were looking at the process of vision, we said that your lens can be short and stout or your lens can be stretched out and be flattened. When we are looking at things up close in the eyeball, that lens needs to be short and stout. It needs to be squished down to be able to see things up close. Well, as we get older, the lens gets a little bit harder. The proteins that are inside of it get more stiff, which means it gets harder for me to squeeze them back together to be short and stout. The first problem with presbyopia is that my lens has gotten harder. It's harder for me to squeeze it down like I need to do to be able to see things that are up close. The second problem that I have is right here in my picture. It's with the ciliary body. Hey, remind me, when I talk about the ciliary body, what was its job again? We called them, by the way, let me give you the term that we called them. It's the same thing. Ciliary muscles and the ciliary body. It's the same thing. What's the job of the ciliary muscles, also known as the ciliary body? What do those things do? What's their job normally? Put it that way. Yeah, so these are muscles. They expand and contract. When they expand and contract, they change the shape of the lens. Okay, so these muscles that are supposed to change the shape of the lens, as you get older, those muscles get weaker. It's what happens with aging, right? Muscles get weaker. Except here's, here's kind of the perfect storm, right? So here's the muscles that are supposed to pull on my lens to make my lens change shape. Expand or contract to make my lens change shape. Except these muscles are starting to get a little bit weaker. They're not doing as good of a job at squeezing down, contracting. If they don't squeeze down, it's hard to put any pressure on the lens to squeeze down as well. And oh, by the way, the lens just got harder while we're at it. I would need stronger muscles to be able to bend it anyway. So in presbyopia, I can't change the shape of my lens because my lens is too hard and my muscles that are supposed to change its shape are too weak. Like I said, we've got the perfect storm going on here. Muscles don't work right. The structure they're pulling on doesn't work right either. The result is, is the same as what we saw with my eyeball being the wrong shape. The result is that I can't see those things that come in up close because when I try to focus those light waves, I send them too far back in the eyeball. I don't adjust, I don't bend the light waves right to get them to the right place on the retina. So presbyopia and hyperopia, two disorders that have a similar problem in that the light goes behind the retina, except those disorders are caused by different problems. 
One of them is caused, this one here that we're looking at, is caused by a problem with the lens and the ciliary body or the ciliary muscles. They're not working right. The other one, hyperopia, is a problem with the shape of the eyeball. So make sure we can distinguish between how those are different from each other. Eyeball shape versus an issue with some of those eyeball structures. One more vision disorder. Uh, do people with, with presbyopia wear bifocals is the question. Um, so the reason that someone would wear bifocals is if they, they need to adjust light two different ways. Um, so when you talk about bifocal lenses, that means that I need to, to uh, bifocal literally means to focus. Um, so if somebody is having trouble seeing up close because their lens is really hard, we would need to use, to use our words from before, we would need to use a convex lens um, if someone has presbyopia. That'd be the, the first kind of focal in bifocal. If it's a bifocal, that means that part of their lens is also a concave lens. Help me out. Which vision disorder did we say used concave lenses? Yeah, myopia. Myopia. Okay, so, so here's the boat that, that Dr. Aulis is going to be in. Uh, in not that many years. I won't share how many years based on that age range. Um, in not that many years, I'm probably going to end up in bifocals too. Um, because patients who start off with myopia, who can't see things well that are far away, we have the, the ability uh, or the need to have a concave lens. We're nearsighted. Yeah, like, like we're saying here in the chat, we're nearsighted. So I am correcting my light waves with a concave lens just to be able to see in general. When my lens starts to get a little bit harder, when my ciliary muscles start to get a little bit weaker, now I've got this issue too that the stuff that's really close to me is also not focusing in the right place. So to correct that, that's not something that a concave lens can help me out with. I need a different shape. So a bifocal lens, I've never drawn this before, so let's, let's see how this goes. Here's our lens. We're doing like the, the retro glasses, right? We got the retro glasses going on, this, the perfect circles here. Okay, in a bifocal lens, the bottom half of the lens is going to bulge out, or it's going to be concave. The top part of the lens is going to be convex. It's going to kind of bulge in. So we've got the two different shapes to the lens. We've got our, our convex part and our concave part which is why someone with bifocals, you'll, you'll see them where they go up and they go down, right? Depending on what they're looking at. Eileen mentioned progressives, where we kind of go, where, where instead of there being two distinct regions inside the, the glasses, they kind of blend into each other to make it a little less awkward and obvious, right? The, the up down thing. Um, but when we talk about, I'll toss this out there too. When we talk about reading glasses, right? Surely we've all heard of reading glasses. Um, reading glasses are, are an example of, of a convex lens. So reading glasses, they bulge out um, to help you get that light in, let light focus closer. So that big long tangent to say that the reason someone would have, we'll label it up here, bifocals, is if they have two vision problems at once. If originally, before they got old, right, I'll say it because I'm almost there, right? I'm almost old. So when we get older and we're, we're going to develop presbyopia, if you already had myopia ahead of time, then you've got one vision disorder and then we got to add another vision disorder on top of it because aging sucks, right? So that's that's the idea behind bifocals. Yeah, Eileen's like, I'm there too. <laughs> yep, it, it's a party, right? Getting old is a party. So we'll we'll just all do it together and it's awesome. I, uh, I always get questions, too, um, the, that, that bring out the cynic in me that are like, how come reading glasses are so cheap and, like, regular glasses are so not cheap? Like, for any of my friends that have myopia, like me, like, just going to be real here. Like, I have to resort to buy my glasses on the Internet because, like, even with vision insurance, it's so terrible because my vision is awful. Um, 
uh, yeah, so when we when we have concave lenses, we ha they get very specific in the prescription. Um, I would also like to to put this out there too. Everybody at some point in their life is going to need reading glasses. If everybody needs them, then like we want to make sure they're cheap, right? That they're available to to everyone. So um, reading glasses. My mom likes to joke that she always buys hers at the dollar store because then she can lose them and it doesn't matter. So reading glasses are super cheap. They're really not specific. Um, here to toss this out for you, reading glasses or, or concave lenses in general, these ones have, or convex lenses. No, did I get that right? Convex lenses, sorry. Uh, convex lenses ha have a positive prescription. So when you look at reading glasses, they're like plus one, two, five, or plus 2.5, et cetera. Uh, that's the way reading glasses are. For those of us here with myopia, with those concave lenses, here, let's just be real. Doc, you want to know Dr. Allis's prescription? Right here. Negative 10, negative 7.5. Oh, it's bad news. It's real bad over here. So, um, yeah, when you're looking at, at someone who has myopia, they, uh, they can't see uh, up far away in the distance. That's going to be a negative prescription. When you look at somebody that can't see up close, that's going to be a positive prescription. Just as a heads up. Now someone in our class needs to become um, an optometrist, right? Because we've spent so much time talking about these things, right? So, oh yeah, some some cute ones, and then so, so probably some cute reading glasses mentioning there in uh, in the chat. Blue light blockers, yeah. Remember now we know from yesterday, right? We talked about why blue light blocking might be a good idea. Help you get some sleep at night. Uh, yeah, so blue purple kind of those those wavelengths are pretty close to each other. Usually blue purple kind of goes glow goes together. Um, we didn't even actually include purple technically on um, that that picture that we looked at with the wavelengths of light. Um, so yeah, so so blue light and purple light are very closely related. Purple just travels a little bit faster. Um, so if it says that it's blue blocking, it probably blocks purple too. So it's it's maybe worth the little extra money you pay to get that that coating on your glasses. I put that on my glasses, and then like when I'm staying up really late working on stuff, I will take out my contacts and purposely put on my glasses because like when I'm staring at my computer for three hours straight, I want to like help my body go to sleep when I'm ready to go to sleep. Um, so sometimes I'll put on my glasses just for that reason to block that, that blue light or that purple light. So, yeah. All right. One more vision disorder for us to mention. And then I'm going to make you guys compare and contrast for me. The last vision disorder is that one that we mentioned earlier in the chat. And that is astigmatism. I want to put this out to my friends here, here in the chat. Um, what is, is going on in astigmatism? Help me out. What, what do we know about astigmatism? What's, what's shaped wrong? What, what does it do in the eyeball? What are some of the things we know? Okay. Yep. So, so Pilar chimed in that the live light, wa light waves are focused at more than one place. Absolutely. Yep. And we can see that right here. Light waves focused at more than one place. Um, and the, the big thing that that makes these light waves focus in the wrong place is the shape of the cornea. The issue is the cornea. So normal situation, your cornea is supposed to be shaped like a sphere, supposed to be circular. In patients with astigmatism, it's a little bit more of an oval shape. So regardless of whether you have nearsightedness or farsightedness, whatever else is going on with your eyeball. Um, in a patient with astigmatism, this outer layer, the cornea, that originally bends light for us, now instead of being a circle shape, a sphere shape, now it's an oval shape. So it's a little bit flatter, which means the way that those light waves come into the eyeball and get bent by the cornea is slightly off. And the lens can't, can't fix what's going on with the light waves getting getting slightly off when they come in. The lens just tries to focus them and they end up focusing at multiple places. Now, in, in this particular um, image that we're looking at, one of those places happens to be in that vitreous humor. One of those places happens to be actually back behind the retina. 
it would be possible for both of these focal points to be at different places on the retina. Um, it, so it, it doesn't really matter where we say those two focal points are. Um, what matters is that there's more than one. Because remember, for you to be able to perceive light waves, they have to be focused all at the same place. So it doesn't matter where I put these two X's. It doesn't matter where the focal points end up. Just the fact that they're not both right here, one focal point, uh, where it's all focused together, that's the problem with astigmatism. Eileen asked, are you born with this? Um, yes, this would be another one that, that develops earlier in life. Uh, if you watch one of the videos, they do also mention that you could induce this in yourself. Um, I guess theoretically by rubbing your eyes a ton, we could change the shape of our cornea. Uh, but what I think makes it more likely for you to have a stigma is that you're born with an, with an oval shaped uh, cornea, There's the shape of your cornea, or it changes a little bit over time. Yeah, or maybe through an injury, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but astigmatism, when we talk about this, this uh, can be, and I think often is, on top of another vision disorder. So you'd have astigmatism and you'd have myopia or astigmatism and press myopia. So um, this would be another reason that we might have to have those bifocal lenses if we have to uh, correct an astigmatism and then we're also getting older and and it's harder to see. Yeah, Eileen's like, or just all three. Yeah, it's, it's highly possible. We can just have all kinds of things going on with the eyeballs for sure. Okay, here's what I want to do to pause for a moment and give us a chance to kind of collaborate here in our classroom. I'm gonna pull up a blank whiteboard here and I'm gonna do what I recommended that you guys do in the notes. So you're gonna help me fill things in here. So we have uh, hyperopia, we have myopia, we have presbyopia, and astigmatism. Okay, here's here's the kinds of things, and I, I outline this for you in the notes too. What the kinds of things I think we should put on this table, and we're gonna help each other out here with it. Um, first thing that that we should 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 know is big picture. What's that's gonna be too close to my hyperopia here. Big picture, what's wrong? So in the very basic, simplest terms, what's going wrong in each of these disorders? Biggest picture. Uh, second thing we should know is what part or parts, we'll put in parentheses here, parts of eyeball are malfunctioning. Last thing I think we should know is who gets this or when does this develop? So I'm gonna take a moment here. I am gonna go off camera and off mic, and I want you guys here in the chat, I want us to try to build this table together. Um, the idea behind building this table is let's see if we can figure out who's similar um, and who's different. What makes these different disorders that we're learning about here, what makes them the same, what makes them different? So I am going to yield the floor to the chat and give you guys a little bit of time here. Let's see if you can get this, this table filled in because wink, wink, nudge, nudge, this is a great study table for you. So let me give you a little bit of time here to see if we can fill in the parts of this table.
Yeah, Eileen's wishing you could write on the board. Here's what I'll do. I'll take some of the stuff that you guys are typing in the chat and I will start trying to update the board as we go. If you see something that you feel like ended up in the wrong place or maybe it wasn't quite clear in the chat because I'll, I'll update it as we go. Um, if you see something that looks wrong, flag it in the chat for me and we'll cross it out and we'll figure out what's wrong with it. So let me start outlining some of the stuff you guys are saying. Okay, so I think I was mostly tracking with you guys here in the chat. This is the notes that I took from what you guys what you guys said. Are there any places on here that we want to add extra information? Is there anything we want to correct? Yeah, so I think that we have we have the note, the part that's malfunctioning. I'll, I'll add a note here next to it that the cornea is the wrong shape. Wrong shape here. Maybe we can add a note for ourselves here. Impressed biopia, what's wrong with the lens? What's going on with that lens to cause pressed biopia? Yeah, the lens hardened, the lens hardened. I guess I should have not just put ciliary, ciliary muscles, right? Uh, yeah, they're, they're weakened. They're not strong anymore. Perfect. Yep, the ciliary muscles got weak. The lens got hard. That gives me, here we'll all be a little more specific here, like we were before, age-related farsightedness uh, versus hyperopia, which is just general farsightedness. Like you guys were saying in the chat, we've got these ones here for who, who gets it or what we see it in. Hyperopia, myopia, and astigmatism, all of those can be seen in young people 
we only see presbyopia with aging. Uh, do we need to know how it's treated is the question. Um, you need to know how it's treated in general terms. So uh, what I mean by that is <clears throat> we want to know that someone who has hyperopia, um, someone who hyper, has hyperopia, their eyeball is too short. It's squeezed. Um, we want to know that in those patients, I'm going to put lenses in front of them that makes it so the light doesn't travel quite as far in the eyeball. I'm, again, I'm not going to ask you the words convex or concave. But you do want to know that since someone who has hyperopia, they're farsighted, the problem is those light waves are going too far. So the way that I treat them is I make the light waves not go quite as far in the eyeball. Same thing here with presbyopia, that I would treat them with a kind of lens that makes those, um, those light waves not go as far into the eyeball. With myopia, it's the opposite, right? I would use lenses that make the light waves travel farther into the eyeball. So um, in terms of how it's treated, that's what I want you to know. Am I trying to make the light waves go farther into the eyeball? Am I trying to make them go closer? Or in the case of something like astigmatism, am I trying to help them focus on just one point? So if you know what's wrong with the eyeball in each of these disorders, I think you'd be able to predict those, um, those kinds of answers, what I'd be looking for there. So does it go farther? Does it go shorter? Does it focus it in one place? That's what you would need to know about treatment. All right, thumbs up, thumbs down, dance party. How are we feeling about vision disorders? Vision disorders are a big part of, of the process of vision. So we've just knocked out a huge part of what you guys need to know from lesson number, number 13. I'll get you a little penguin going on over here. Our daily penguin. We got some dance party action going on over here in the chat. Okay, well, I'm not getting any last minute questions, which means I'm going to go ahead and move us on. This table that we just made together, man, if we were in class, I would tell you this is an underline highlight star table. This is a great way for you to compare information. The other thing you could do too, if you are a visual learner, is I didn't do it on the table here, but you could go through and color code stuff. So what I mean by that is we could color code with this whole statement here, we say can't see near. Maybe I make that red and I make it red over here in presbyopia, I can't see near. And then I make blue, the fact that I can't see far. And then I make astigmatism, the fact that light goes in multiple places, make that yellow, make a different color. So you can color code because then you can briefly look at your table and see, okay, the thing that's wrong here in hyperopia and presbyopia, it's the same color, it's the same thing. Or who gets it? That's the same thing in all disorders except for presbyopia. So consider doing some color coding to help you as you're studying. Uh, just just to, to help you group things together. So that would be an, an extra piece of advice tossing out there for you. So let me go back to our lesson here. Now that we've talked about the disorders of the eyeball, let's talk a little bit more about how we actually perceive light inside, uh, inside the eyeball. I'll go back on video for you just because, you know, then you know I'm still here. I didn't leave. All right. When we talk about perceiving color or black and white, when we talk about seeing in general, that's the job of cells called rods and cones. Rods and cones. Uh, remind me, because I'm forgetful here, um, what part of the eyeball do the rods and cones live inside of? Where do rods and cones live? Exactly. Yeah, several of us are chiming in. Rods and cones are found in the retina. This is why, friendly reminder, this is why light has to get focused on the retina because this is where the light cells are found. The rods and cones live inside the retina. An important thing for us to be able to do on the homework assignment and on the exam, again, is compare and contrast. So 
as we're going through and talking about these cell types, always keep in the back of your mind what's the same about them, what's different about them. Okay, so let's start off here with, with my rod here on the end. Rods, there's only one type. All the rods in your eyes are the same. All the rods in your eyes, here's a, a nice, easy to remember, they have a protein called rhodopsin. Looks a whole lot like the word rod. Uh, so all of these little colored things you see up here, all of these are rhodopsin proteins. These are the proteins in a rod that when you're detecting light, um, these are the ones that are going to be, be activated. Hey, we were freaking out about the, the cumulative final exam, right? So let's do a cumulative final exam review question. When I talk about proteins, they do or do not have to be in the right shape to do their job. Proteins do or do not have to be the right shape. They do, absolutely, yes. Proteins must be in the right shape to do their job. Okay, so the job of rhodopsin proteins is to tell a rod when you're perceiving light. So these rhodopsin proteins have one shape when you're not perceiving light and another shape when you are perceiving light because the light waves actually come in and cause these proteins to change their shape. The way that a rod sees light or the way that it gets activated is because the energy from those light waves that are bouncing up and down, that energy bumps into a protein and it goes from one shape to another shape. And when it's that other shape, my rod detects that and that tells it that it's seeing light. So rhodopsin proteins that I find in rods, there's really only kind of one range of light that they're activated by. You can see it over here on the purple or excuse me, on the graph over here. The color that rods are activated by uh, is, is on average, it travels at a speed of, of 500 nanometers. Um, so that means it's, it's going up and down, uh, has a wavelength of 500 nanometers. That, that means that it's kind of, there's a range of colors that, that rods can see in, but, but the deal is there's just one kind of rod. So I don't collect specific information with rods, I basically just collect the message, are we seeing something or are we not seeing something? Rods are, are by themselves, there's just one of them. So my rods are the type of cells, um, help me out for those, those of us that have worked through here. Do rods see in color or black and white? Who remembers that's worked through here? Do rods see in color or black and white? Yeah, my rods are going to be the black and white. Black and white, yeah, or I like how someone put it, non-color, yeah. These are essentially the kind of, uh, the job of, of a rod, they're kind of a, I like to call it an all or nothing cell. Either you're activated, meaning I'm seeing something, or you're not activated, I'm not seeing anything. Um, there, there's just this one range that they can be activated in. So rods see in black and white, either you, you can see or you can't see. That's the job of rods. When we talk about cones, cones don't use rhodopsin proteins. Cones use a protein called a photopsin. So a photopsin protein has a different shape. There are actually three different ones of them, three different photopsin proteins. And as you can see in the picture here, those three different photopsin proteins collect three different colors of light or three different wavelengths of light. Uh, so I can see over on the left, my, my photopsin proteins that would be really good at collecting light waves kind of in the red range. So you see over here how I can collect all the way down here in the red range, up here through yellows into, into the greens. This first kind of rod collects light in, in a range of wavelengths. It averages right around, right around 560 here. By the way, I'm absolutely not gonna ask you numbers, so please don't memorize these numbers, not worth it. Second uh, rod that I see inside here has a photopsin protein that, that looks more green. So this would be a, uh, a protein that is activated kind of down starting in the orange range, orange through yellow through green kind of into a little bit of purple there's a range of wavelengths that would this cone would register at 
um, but the average of where it registers at is, is kind of around green. And then we've got our last one over here, that last photopsin protein. You can see on, on my graph over on the left that it doesn't get activated uh, by light in the red, orange, yellow range. It starts in green and gets activated through kind of the blues and the purples ends of the spectrum here. When we talk about the process of you doing color vision, seeing things in color, the way you see things in color is by here. Let's let's tie in a, a lesson number 11 word here or lesson 10 word. Color vision is done by integration. Integration. When I mix together the messages of these three cells, that's going to give me an idea of which specific color I'm seeing. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's it's the processing. Sometimes I like to call integration because remember, in a neuron, we do that at the axon hillock, right? Sometimes I like to, to think of integration, especially at the axon hillock, where we throw everything into a blender, mix it up, and see what comes out. We take the messages from each of these different uh, cones that are collecting different colors, and we see what it averages out to. So if, if it's just my red and green cones that get activated, we're probably looking at, or uh, we're probably going to color somewhere over here in the green range. If I'm only activating my green cone and my blue cone, then I know I'm, I'm probably somewhere over here in the purple blue range. So I have three different kinds of cones that are all activated. Remember, they've got their photopsin protein that the light comes in and changes its shape. And we can detect how much it changes it. I mix together how much it changed it for each of, of these different cones. And that's going to allow me to figure out which color I'm seeing. So the fact that there's more than one type of cone allows you to see in color. There's just one type of rod, so we can't see in color with the rods. We're seeing in black and white. Now, who remembers from, from working on, on this activity here, rods or cones, which of these need a lot of light to function? Who needs a lot of light to function? Is it the rods or the cones? What do I have to have bright light for? Yeah, I've got to have bright light for the cones. Cones need bright light. <coughs> Excuse me. For you to be able to see in color, we have to have a bunch of light. That light then will activate these cones to various degrees. Rods work in dim light. And this is where in the activity I, I recommended for you, again, because we're in quarantine, right? So we got nothing better to do. Um, go out in your backyard at, at twilight tonight and look around you and notice how we see in black and white. We don't see in color when there's not a lot of light out there. The fact that we can see in black and white is thanks to our rods. My rods don't need a lot of light. So the, the way that our, our table is going to describe them here in a minute is that they have high sensitivity, meaning it doesn't take much light to activate these cells. The cones have low sensitivity, meaning it's going to need we're going to need all the light in the world to activate these to, to get them to be able to figure things out. One of the other important differences between rods and cones is where I find them in the eyeball. Which of these types of cells, rods or cones, which of those lives in the very middle of the eyeball? The place where I normally focus my light. Who lives there? Yeah, my, my cones. Cones are so found in the middle of the eyeball. Found in the middle of the eyeball. That's where my cones are. There is a place in the eyeball that I only have cones. I don't have any rods. Has anyone found the name of that place when they were watching a couple of, there's a couple of videos that mention it. Does anyone remember it? Yeah, so it's a weird word. Uh, this would be a word for us to write down for ourselves because it's. I don't know if it's in any of the other notes places. Uh, there's a place in the eyeball called the fovea, sometimes called the fovea centralis. We actually labeled that on, on our eyeball at the end of class last time. The fovea centralis is an indentation in the back of the eyeball where I only have cones. And the fovea centralis is the main place that we're trying to focus light waves on the eyeball. 
um, we're trying to send them to this place here with the cones. Because the deal is the cones, while they need bright light, they also see things really clearly. So the fovea centralis, the very center of, of your retina, this is where I have the most cones. And this is going to be uh, the, the place as well where I see the most clearly. My rods live in what we call the peripheral retina. So your retina goes all the way around the eyeball. And we've got tons of rods everywhere. There's way more rods in your eyeball than there are cones. There's only cones in this place called the fovea centralis. So cones, see in rods, see in black and white. Underline, highlight, star this table, if you have not already in your notes. We just kind of talked through these ideas. The, um, the learning, the, the, the lesson and kind of the guided learning activity goes through each of these things as well. Again, you know how much I love my compare and contrast. So the other thing that I guarantee I'm going to ask you to do on, on exam number four is to compare and contrast rods and cones. So here's some of that most important information. The other thing you'll want to add to this table, since it didn't make it onto the table, um, what's the name of the type of protein that rods have inside of them that detects light? What was the name of that protein inside my rods that detects light? Yeah, it's the one that starts with the R, right? The, we want to add to the table that we use rhodopsin proteins rhodopsin proteins in my rods. In the cones, we use the photopsin proteins. And remember, there are three different kinds. There's three different kinds. They kind of hint at that right here, three visual pigments, AKA three different photopsin proteins compared to just one rhodopsin protein. So make sure we can compare and contrast our rods and cones this way. Um, like I said, and like you guys know, I do love me some compare and contrast. So these types of cells would be a good compare and contrast. Hey, I can think of something that makes them the same. These are all the differences between them. I can think of something that makes them the same. Which part of the eyeball are rods and cones found inside of? Where do rods and cones live in the eyeball? Exactly, they live inside the retina. So if we wanted to make our list of, of things that makes them the same, um, both of these cells are found in the retina. There's a similarity. My table outlines all the differences. There's something that's the same. Both of them are, are found in the retina. So make sure um, as you're wrapping up the process of vision and you're studying, make sure that you do watch the videos related to the process of vision. There are a few things, um, for example, that fovea centralis. Um, there are a few things like, I'll mention this here, bipolar cells and ganglion cells that are only mentioned in the videos that are not in the guided learning activity. So please make sure that we take time to watch those videos and answer the questions so that, that we know all about the cell types, so that we know um, about that fovea centralis. Uh, the videos should be worthwhile for you. So make sure to check those out. With that, we're finally done with vision. Hooray, right? So, Hopefully, though, uh, with, with vision, I always love talking about vision, right, because my eyes are so terrible. So hopefully you understand your own eyes a little bit better. Um, that's kind of the goal in taking so much time on those vision disorders. Um, I'm going to be sly, Pilar, and I'm not necessarily going to answer your question. Um, I'll put it to the class and see if there are any friends that can help us out here. Uh, Pilar asked, we talked about, the, I mentioned those cell types, the, the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells. Um, Pilar is asking if the bipolar cells are the, um, the ones that take the messages. Um, let me put that. To, well, I, I don't know if I quite understand the question. Uh, Pilar, are you talking about take the messages out of the eyeball or take the messages from rods and cones? OK, so Pilar is asking, are bipolar cells the ones that take the message out of the eyeball? 
Let me put that to the class. Do bipolar cells take the message out of the eyeball? What do we think? Yeah, that is actually the job of the ganglion cells. Yep, the ganglion cells are the ones that take the message out of the eyeball. The bipolar cells are the ones that collect the messages. Yeah, like Rosa said, the bipolar cells connect to the rods and the cones. Um, in, the, in the retina, we'll do a little drawing here. Um, very basic right here. We have actually have three layers of cells inside the retina. Okay, this layer back here is my rods and cones. Rods and cones. This layer next to it is what we call the bipolar cells. And then we have the layer that's the ganglion cells. Ganglion cells. I cannot spell those today. Fun fact, light waves actually come in from this direction. Um, scientists like to say that the eyeball is evolutionarily backwards uh, because the front of your eye, so if we add up here, my cornea is way out here. My lens is out here. So when I send light waves back into the retina, because all of this is the retina, they actually have to pass in front of the ganglion cells, in front of the bipolar cells, before they can get to the rods and cones. So fun fact that light goes backwards, if you will, through the retina, it goes down to the rods and cones, and then I gotta send those messages back up. Think about the bipolar cells. <coughs> kind of like a funnel. They collect information from the rods and cones, condense it down. They give it to the ganglion cells. The ganglion cells will take it out of the eyeball. And I know we talked about this last time here. When the ganglion cells take it out of the eyeball, what is the name of the cranial nerve that they come together and form? What cranial nerve do I send this information out with? Yeah, the optic nerve. So cranial nerve two, that's the optic nerve. Cranial nerve number two is made out of the ganglion cells. So bipolar cells, that middle layer wedged in. Again, think about it kind of like a funnel where it focuses my information that the rods and the cones collect. Bipolar cells then share that focused information with the ganglion cells and the ganglion cells come together to make the optic nerve. Yeah. Okay, process of hearing. Briefly mention on here, um, again, that this is not a physics class, so I am not going to, to ask you um, which kinds of sounds travel quickly versus which kinds of cells travel more, or sounds, excuse me, travel more slowly. Um, but just as a heads up for you, the reason why we have to perceive sound all across a long tube in different places inside your inner ear is because some of those sound waves are traveling really slowly and some of them travel really fast. So again, not gonna ask you low pitch versus high pitch, but that squealing tire sound that you hear, that has to do with how quickly these sounds are, sound waves are moving. Uh, a, a lower pitched voice, someone who talks very low, those sound waves travel a little bit more slowly. <coughs> Just like we didn't get to do the eyeball in lab, we also didn't get to do the ear. So I found a few pictures for you to um, really help you get an idea of the parts of the ear. The first thing you wanna make sure you know about the ear is that it's divided into three main regions. So the three main regions of the ear have really easy names. The external ear that's on the outside, that's external. The middle ear that's in the middle and the way that we're gonna refer to this part here is the internal ear internal ear i mean inner ear gives you the same idea but we're we're going to call it the internal ear here in the in, in the inside which of these three parts for my friends who have started on on hearing and balance is it the external ear the middle ear or the internal ear where do i actually perceive sound where do i hear sound waves which part of the ear has the cells that do that Ooh, it is not actually the middle ear. It is actually 
the internal ear, the part of your ear where you actually perceive sounds or where you actually hear them is here in the internal ear. The middle ear helps to pass them on. The external ear helps to collect them. So if we put in, in big picture terms here, we collect sound waves in the external ear. The middle ear, uh, we can maybe say transmits sound waves, passes them on. The internal ear hears the sound waves. Does anyone happen to know the name of the particular part of the internal ear that you hear with? Which part of the internal ear do we hear with? If someone's deaf, they might get an implant for this. Yeah, a couple of us are chiming in. It's this one right here, the cochlea. The cochlea is the part of the internal ear that actually does hearing. The other thing that the internal ear does, yeah, it looks like a snail. You know what's surprisingly hard to say? Is snail shell shaped. I, I know that from last semester in lab when I was trying to tell my students that the cochlea is the snail shell shaped structure in the internal ear. So say that one five times fast, or try to say it twice, it's really hard. Snail shell shaped structure, that's the cochlea there and there. So. Uh, the internal ear does hearing. The internal ear also does equilibrium. It also does balance. Equilibrium is done by structures that are not labeled on this particular picture, but I can see a couple of them up here. These guys are called the semicircular canals up here. Yeah, the vestibule together. So semicircular canals, and there's some parts hiding um, here along the back part as well called the saccule and the uterol. Yeah, I guess it is labeled as the vestibule. So there you go. That's my balance part here. We'll talk about that on Friday, the balance stuff. Okay, this picture is an underlined highlight star picture because it talks you through the process of hearing. Um, with this, this picture, I want you to imagine that the cochlea, the snail shell shaped part of the internal ear, we took it instead of being all curled up on itself, we actually stretched it out. So inside the cochlea, where you do, do hearing, we actually have three fluid-filled tubes. So these are tubes that we definitely need to know their names of, and we need to know their locations. The top tube in the cochlea is called scala vestibuli. A good way to remember that that's the top tube and the first tube is it's right next to the vestibule area. So the first tube that sound waves go into um, it is a tube called scala vestibuli. Sound waves are actually perceived in the middle tube of the ear called the cochlear duct. And when I'm done hearing sound waves, when I'm ready to get rid of them so I don't hear them forever, those go out through the scala tympani. So we've got the scala vestibuli, let me get a color here, scala vestibuli on top, then we've got the cochlear duct in the middle, and scala tympani down at the bottom. Please, please, please make sure we don't mix those three up. We gotta make sure we know the order that sound waves go in them. Um, vestibuli first, then into the cochlear duct, then down into to scala tympani. Um, Eileen, tubes do not go in the internal ear. Tubes actually go right here in a structure called the tympanic membrane. Um, the job of tubes, so like my daughter, for example, got tubes in her ear. Um, the job of tubes is when a, a baby has recurrent ear infections, this area right here is supposed to be filled with air. There's not supposed to be anything in here. Um, but the problem is this little tube that, that's chilling out down here, this goes down into the back of your throat. And in children, this tube is pretty much horizontal until their skull fully develops and it, and it angles down. It's a horizontal tube. So a, a baby gets a sinus infection and the bacteria finds this little tube right here and says, sweet, it's a new place for me to live. And you get an infection where there's a bunch of bacteria and pus and, and nasty stuff up here in the middle ear. So in children who have a lot of these kinds of tubes, they actually will cut a little tiny hole in the tympanic membrane and insert a, a little plastic tube in here 
So it's literally a place for, for that pus and bacteria to drain out of so that, like you mentioned, to relieve the pressure that comes from there being an infection in here. It also gives you a direct route to, to put antibiotics into the area to actually treat an infection that's up here. So um, when we talk about a baby getting tubes in their ears, that's over here in the tympanic membrane. All this stuff over here inside the cochlea, we definitely don't want to mess with this stuff because this is where we do do the hearing. So, um, yeah, tubes in the ears, that that little thing, little space right there in the tympanic membrane. OK, so sound waves, process of hearing. And again, you'll want to watch the videos and read about this in your guided lessons. Sound waves come in from the external ear. They're going to vibrate their way through the three smallest ear bones in the body here in the, in the middle ear. They're called the ossicles. Uh, so there are three ossicles called the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. Malleus means the hammer. The incus means an anvil, like that thing that that roadrunner used to drop on Wiley e. Coyote, if there's anyone who knows who either of those characters are. Uh, it's the, the big thing the blacksmith has. We'll put it, put it that way. And then uh, the, the stapes, which literally means stirrup. Like if you were riding a horse, this is what you would put your foot in, is inside the stapes, the stirrup. So sound waves come from the environment, vibrate their way through these ossicles, and then they bump into a structure that's an underlying highlight star called the oval window. This oval window is a dividing line between the places that are filled with air and the places that are filled with fluid. The internal ear is filled with fluid. And there are two kinds of fluid that it's filled with, which we'll mention here in another picture. But what you need to know in the most basic terms is that we go from vibrating through air filled areas to fluid filled areas in the internal ear. And my oval window is the gateway that gets me in to the internal ear. So sound waves start vibrating in scala vestibuli, this first tube here. As they, they vibrate through scala vestibuli, they, they travel and travel, travel through this until they find the place in the cochlear duct, which is the middle tube, where they can actually be perceived. So remember, some of my sound waves travel really fast. If I travel really fast, I don't have to go very far before I can actually go into the cochlear duct. If I travel really slowly, that slow traveling sound wave is going to have to travel farther in the cochlear duct, or excuse me, farther down to its place in the cochlear duct. So then those sound waves bounce around a little bit in this cochlear duct here in the middle. But as soon as we've perceived them, as soon as it's caused my hair cells to start picking up signals, I'll actually get rid of that sound wave and send it down here to scala tympani at the bottom. Once sound waves are, are here in scala tympani, the way that I like to describe it, scala tympani is the place that sound waves go to die. Uh, because when you put sound waves in scala tympani, you will not hear them anymore. So this bottom tube here in, in the cochlea, scala tympani, so this is where sound waves go to die. It vibrates through the tube, gets to this place over here called the round window. The round window is a membrane that on the other side is back in the middle ear, except there's no bones out here to catch that sound wave. So those sound waves literally just, just fall apart and we don't hear them anymore. So the process of hearing starts in the external ear. It goes through the bones of the middle ear, works it way, its way then through each of these three tubes in the internal ear inside the cochlea. Process of hearing. Let me pop up the last thing we're gonna work on today. We'll talk about channels on Friday and then we'll move on. Um, the last thing I wanna talk about today are the two types of fluid that I find in the internal ear. The first type of fluid that I find in the internal ear is called perilymph fluid. Perilymph fluid. When you think of perilymph, um, think of a type of fluid that does not directly help with hearing. Uh, perilymph is just a fluid for sound waves to move through. It doesn't help out with, with the process of hearing. What does help with the process of hearing is endolymph endolymph fluid. Endolymph fluid is the fluid that I find inside that middle tube. I should mention
extension for you, by the way. Sorry for my, my visually oriented friends. If you remember in the last picture, we saw the cochlea all spread out in a line. Imagine if you took that spread out line, you sliced it like you slice a sausage, I guess, and then you rotated it sideways. That's what we're looking at right here. So this was my top tube. This was my middle tube. This is my bottom tube for my, my visually oriented friends. So it's the same three tubes that we saw before. We're just looking at them from the other direction now. So the cochlear duct, the one in the middle, is where you perceive sounds. Yeah, think about it kind of like a mid-sagittal cut. I like that. Yeah, so we're in, instead of looking at it from a frontal view, now we went mid-sagittal. We're, we're cross-sectioning it. That's perfect. Cochlear duct is where you hear sounds. The cochlear duct is filled with a fluid called endolymph. For my friends who happen to work this far in the lesson, there are two cations that endolymph has inside of it. Does anyone happen to remember what cations, positive things, endolymph has? Endolymph fluid has, yes, we're, we're chiming in here, it has potassium, K plus, and calcium, Ca2 plus. Endolymph has potassium and calcium. This is, endolymph fluid is going to help me out with the process of activating the cells that detect sound. So the cells that detect sound, and here's just a fair warning for us for the rest of what we're, we're going to talk about. The cells that detect sound and balance and taste and smell, they're all called hair cells. Hair cells. These guys are going to pop up everywhere. Hair cells in special senses. Hair cells actually, so here's where we get a little bit, remember from yesterday, wonky and donkey. Hair cells are a type of neuron, which means that when I activate them, they're going to do our typical thing, right? Our favorite graph, the graph I promise you will be on the final exam. In a normal neuron, what I use right here to make my membrane depolarized, to make it go positive, I normally use sodium. Hair cells are a little bit wonky and donkey. They depolarize their membrane using potassium. So the reason that I mention that endolymph fluid has potassium is this is actually the cation that, that a hair cell is gonna use to make it depolarize its membrane. And when it depolarizes its membrane, that's going to allow it to send a message down to the nerve or down to the neuron that lives underneath it. The way that I get it to send a message is using calcium. When we talked about, about normal neurons, why, uh, why was it helpful to have calcium come into a normal neuron? What did calcium make happen in a normal neuron? What was its job? Yeah, so, so calcium, I, I only brought in calcium. Here, let's draw ourselves a normal neuron to review. The only place that I brought calcium into my neuron was down here at the very end at the axon terminals, because down here at the axon terminals is where I spit out neurotransmitters. Remember, calcium comes in, and my vesicles that have neurotransmitters, they're like, pshaw, I'm piecing out of this party. So I bring in calcium, neurotransmitters leave. Neurotransmitters leave. The job of the calcium that's inside endolymph fluid is to help my hair cells spit out neurotransmitters. The job of the potassium that's inside endolymph fluid is to help me to depolarize polarize the membrane. So potassium and calcium, the two things that endolymph fluid has a lot of. The reason that I, I tell you guys that endolymph fluid is directly involved in hearing, and here's a teaser for us, it's also directly involved in balance, 
is because it's the ion that I use to depolarize my hair cell and it's the ions that I use to release the neurotransmitters. So this fluid right here, whole lot of potassium, whole lot of calcium. These ones out here, not so much, but there's also not any hair cells that live in scala vestibuli or that live in scala tympani. My hair cells, the cells that detect sound, only live here in the middle, in the cochlear duct. And they live in, if I zoom in on this part right here, they live inside something that's called the spiral organ. The spiral organ. So this picture down here shows me the spiral organ. We must know the spiral organ because this is the part of the cochlear duct that actually detects sound waves. So part of the spiral organ, I can see these, these dark blue cells here, these dark blue cells that I circled called the hair cells. The hair cells are the type of cells that detect sound waves. They get their name because if you look, let's see if I can zoom in a little bit here. If I look on the very top surface, see these little tiny things right here? These little tiny things up here are literally called hairs. I talk about the best name ever. These are hair cells with little hairs that stick out on the top of the cells. So I got my hair cells up here. My hair cells live inside this whole structure that's called the spiral organ. So the way that hearing works is I get, let me zoom out again, I get some sound waves that are bouncing through scala vestibuli until they find the place along the cochlear duct where they can be heard because the hair cells are specialized. Some of them hear high pitch, some of them hear low pitch. They can only hear certain sounds. We hit the right place where these bouncing sound waves could be heard, they could be perceived. They bounce into the cochlear duct here. When they bounce into the cochlear duct, they cause this thing down here at the bottom called the basilar membrane, the basilar membrane, to start bouncing up and down because there's sound waves over here that are bouncing up and down. So we got bouncing sound waves that causes this basilar membrane on the bottom of the cochlear duct to start bouncing up and down. These little hair cells that live on top of the basilar membrane, they start bouncing up and down. The problem is when they bounce up and down, they're right next to this thing right here called the tectorial membrane. The tectorial membrane does not move. This membrane is stationary. It's kind of, think of it kind of like the ceiling in the room. The basilar membrane is the bed. Here's those little monkeys jumping on the bed, the hair cells here. They jump so high, they bump into the ceiling, the tectorial membrane. When they bump into the tectorial membrane, their hairs get bent, the little things that stick out on the top. And when their hairs get bent, that's going to open up a special kind of ion channel. For my friends who've worked this far in the lesson, which kind of ion channels, which gate lives on, or I, what kind of gated channels are on these hair cells? Yeah, a couple of us ha have chimed in. Hair cells, and particularly their hairs, hair cells, um, the hair portion, their little hair stick out, have mechanically gated, mechanically gated ion channels mechanically gated way back in unit one so here you go we're, we're doing review for our final exam way back in unit one we talked about mechanically gated channels how do you open up a mechanically gated channel what do i do to open up a mechanically gated channel yeah i have to push them right mechanically is is like the guided lesson says this is like the gate to your backyard Unless you're like super rich, you probably have to push your gate open. So a mechanically gated channel is what I see that lives on top of these little hairs. When they bump into the tectorial membrane, they press on that. That presses open the channels. And the channels that open let in potassium. And when potassium comes inside, that allows me to depolarize my membrane 
and to bring in some of that calcium and to spit out my neurotransmitters. So the process of curing involves, if you want to think about it, little monkeys, my hair cells, jumping on the bed, or maybe more specifically, the bed starts bouncing, we're having an earthquake. Those monkeys bump into the ceiling, they bend their hairs, and that is how I detect the process of sound. Now, once I have activated the hair cells here um, in the spiral organ from my basilar membrane, that basement thing bouncing up and down, I will then send those sound waves here into scala tympani. Remember, scala tympani is where sounds go to die. So I send them here into scala tympani. Then my bed stops bouncing. The basilar membrane doesn't bounce anymore. And that allows me to stop hearing a sound. And that allows me to get rid of my sound waves that I, that I had heard before. So the actual last picture I'll end with here is this one right here. This is an up close and personal look at one of those hair cells. So here's those little hairs that stick out on, on the top of the cell. Here's the cell itself. Notice that hair cells are synapsing with a neuron down below them. This neuron, you'll see it labeled on some pictures. This neuron down here is part of the cochlear nerve, part of the cochlear nerve. The cochlear nerve actually has two parts. Uh, the, we know it as the two parts together, vestibulocochlear, vestibulocochlear nerve. That's a cranial nerve. Does anyone happen to remember the, the number? The vestibulocochlear nerve, cranial nerve number, any takers? Who's my hearing and balance nerve? Yeah, I might need to review our cranial nerves, right? Hearing and balance nerve, it, it is cranial nerve number eight. Vestibular cochlear nerve, that is number eight. So you will see probably uh, on your notes that this is labeled the cochlear nerve. That is half of the cochlear half of cranial nerve number eight. That's what receives, uh, receives the messages from the hair cell telling it that we're hearing something. So... My hair cells spit out neurotransmitters. I see them down here. They're spitting out those neurotransmitters because calcium came inside. Calcium came inside because potassium came inside and depolarized the membrane. Because this out, voltage-gated calcium channels. Voltage-gated channel. When we talk about a voltage-gated channel, what opens those? What opens a voltage-gated channel? Yeah, we're back to the ones we're always used to, charge. So two kinds of channels that we see involved here in the process of hearing, mechanically-gated channels that I find here on the hairs. I press on those. That opens them up. Voltage-gated channels that I find bringing in calcium. That's going to, as I depolarize my membrane, open up these gates to allow me to bring in some calcium to allow me to spit out some neurotransmitters. So hair cells, the special hearing cells, two types of ion channels on them, mechanically gated channels and voltage gated channels. Hey, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. It's going to be the same way with balance. We're going to see mechanically gated channels again. And we're going to see voltage gated channels again. So hearing and equilibrium, very similar. So as you're studying equilibrium and as you're studying taste and smell for, for our class on Friday, um, keep that in mind. Hearing and equilibrium, very similar to one another. Um, I, I see a question from Pilar that asked... Um, what what I was hearing before the sound goes to die. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, sound waves, so, uh, so we, we hear a sound wave in the cochlear duct, and then I, I like to joke that we send it into scala tympani um, for, 
for it to go to die. I don't hear it anymore. What happens before it dies is it bounces around inside the cochlear duct and it causes the basilar membrane to bounce around, which causes these hair cells to bounce and makes them open up their channels. So it, it bounces through each of the three tubes. It's only in that middle tube that uh, it, it, it opens up these mechanically gated channels to cause my hair cells uh, to depolarize, to detect the sound wave. So in the first tube, it's just bouncing, trying to find the right place to get into the cochlear duct. Then it gets into the cochlear duct. You detect it in the cochlear duct. Um, and then you send it into scala vestibuli to get rid of it, or excuse me, scala tympani to get rid of it. You hear and process things when they're inside the cochlear duct, correct? Because the cochlear duct is where I have these hair cells that do detection. Yeah, absolutely. Any other last minute questions before I shut off our recording from today? And we'll talk more on Friday um, about the rates to release these neurotransmitters, because that's our next picture. We'll definitely talk about that on Friday. And we'll talk about balance, and we'll talk about hearing and taste on Friday as well. All right, well, I'm going to say goodbye to my friends on the recording. We will see you guys soon.